Rushma's accomplished quite a bit in her mic, so I'm going to introduce her and read this part quickly so that we can uh, spend the rest of the time listening to what she has to say. She is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code, a national nonprofit organization working to close the gender gap in technology and prepare young women for jobs of the future. She's written a groundbreaking book called Women Who Don't Wait in Line, in which she advocates for a new model of female leadership focused on embracing risk and failure, promoting mentorship and sponsorship, and boldly charting your own course personally and professionally. After years of working as an attorney and supporting the Democratic Party as an activist and fundraiser, Rashma left her private sector career behind and served onto the political scene as the first Indian American woman in the country to run for U.S. Congress. Following the highly publicized race, Rashma stayed true to her passion for public service, becoming Deputy Public Advocate of New York City, and most recently running a spirited campaign for public advocate on a platform of creating educational and economic opportunities for women and girls and those who have been sidelined in the political process. A true political entrepreneur, Rashma has been fearless in her efforts to disrupt both politics and technology to create a positive change. She's a graduate of the University of Illinois, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and Yale Law School. She was recently named a WSJ Magazine Innovator of the Year, one of the 50 most powerful women in New York City by the New York Daily News. She's been on CNBC's Next List, Forbes Most Powerful Women Changing the World, Best Company's 100 Most Creative People, Ad Ages, Ad Ages Creativity 50, Business Insiders 50 Women Who Are Changing the World, City and States Rising Stars, and AOL PBS Next Maker, and Crane Story on the As I read this, it's probably out So, um, if we can start out update about Girls Who Code. How many years has the program been running? How big is it now? How many young women have you trained? How many locations have you been? Well, first of all, I want to say I love Rosina Women. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, she, gosh, come on, we've known each other forever. It doesn't mean it's forever. Uh, I've known Rosina John forever. And uh, we probably shared, I think, still one of the most special numbers that I can think of is when we had this little meeting with Code Fund. There's like four of us. Mm -hmm. Robin Duke. Yes. Robin Duke. And um, since then, she has literally supported everything I've ever done. I feel like I called her tomorrow and said, opening up Big Bridge, she'd buy my first hundred movies. <laughs> 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 That's like the type of person she is. Yeah, um, big blue bridge. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so she's never questioned um, my passion, my commitment, my. She's just always been there. And so I know hopefully later we're going to talk about the sisterhood, but Rosina inspires me about sisterhood. And a lot of the things that I've learned through our friendship is what I teach her young girls. So I wanted to say that first. Um, girls are good. Okay. So uh, we started our program in 2012, and we started with 20 girls. And full confession, I am not a, I'm not a voter, I'm not an engineer. My father would ask me with two plus two, I would say five. He like gave up on me, but like you know, my company and family, we were only supposed to be an engineer. So it was a huge disappointment for a long time. But I came to this problem when I was running for office, and I really saw the gender divide in New York City. And so Girls Code, in many ways, started as an experiment. I am a feminist with a capital pack. And I saw what was happening with the growth of technology jobs, and this question of like, where are the girls? I to answer my questions were inspired to start roles to work as a non coder. And so we started with 20 girls in 2012 in a conference room in New York City in Half Texas on 23rd and 5th. And by the end of this year, we'll teach 10,000. We have programs in 34 states. There are literally girls in a Navajo reservation learning how to code. There are girls in a homeless shelter in Boston learning how to computer program. Uh, we're going to run some are some are immersion programs in 57 companies in nine cities across America, from AppNexus to Amazon to Pixar to just the Alba Associate Program, program at her honest company, you name it. Uh, we are in every single technology company. So it's been in four years. So it's been tremendous. So because you've been so successful so quickly, people might think that you had this great idea and you exploded fully formed and glamorous into the tech world. Right. But um, because we've known each other for such a long time, I've heard a lot of stories about how you got to where you are, and I thought you 
share some tonight. So let's go then and talk a little bit about growing <coughs> up in Illinois and your parents and immigrants and the influence of that had on your early years and your career. So um, my family actually came here as refugees from Uganda. So in the 1970s, he, I mean, the dictator really expelled all the South, all the Indian Americans who were in, out in Indian Americans um, that were in Uganda. My family had been in Africa for generations and generations and generations. And so my parents kind of frantically applied for refugee status to every single country. And they got rejected from everybody except they were fortunate to get accepted to the United States. So they literally, when they got out of math of the United States, they had no idea where to go. And they took out a dart and they threw it, and it landed in Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> and my mother was in the with my sister. And they showed up literally wearing shorts and t-shirts because they had never seen snow before in their life. And built by themselves. And even though my father was a trained engineer, he works as a machinist, my mother sold cosmetics. And education was everything to them. And that's really how I got you know, my start and my passion, both for creating opportunity, but like my, my really nice deep love for this country. I think for a, a very young age, I always wanted to get back. Um, and, you know, I thought politics was the way, now it's really girls of code, and so that, that's really kind of it's where, where I come from. I think it's the heart of my, it's, it's what inspires me to do everything that I do. So you decided to go to law school. I decided to go to law school. Um, I, it's so funny. I was just at I gave the commencement speech at my university, University of Illinois. And I was, I was uh, thinking about this, but I, you know, at a very young age, I also decided I wanted to be a lawyer. I saw, I watched this movie. Everyone's seen the, the accused, Kelly McGillis, <laughs> some other old ladies in this room with me, right? But I'm talking to like younger kids. They have no idea what I'm talking about. But I thought she was so awesome, and I wanted to be just like her. And I made my dad drive me to the library so we could look up the news and world report because I was just as ambitious then because I was going to go to top law school if I was going to be a lawyer. And it was Yale Law School. And I remember I had it printed out and we circled it with a circled it with my Hello Kitty marker and put it on the refrigerator. And I would stare at it every day from the time I was about 12 or 13 until I applied uh, to, to law school. And I got rejected the first time, got rejected the second time, got rejected the third time. And the third time I rejected, I basically got on a train to New Haven and knocked on the dean's door. Uh, he didn't call security. <laughs> <laughs> I talked my way to Yale Law School about a year later. Wow. And you practiced law for a while. I practiced law for a while. And I graduated $300,000 student loan debt. Because I've wow. gotten my master's, gone to law school, uh, worked the whole time, you know. Graduate school is outrageous. College is even more outrageous now. I'm shocked at how much the cost of, of my university education has gone up in a long time. It's still gone up considerably. Um, and I moved to New York City, and I thought that I'd work at a uh, at Law Firm, which is what we work well. I thought I'd pay off my loans, and then boom, I'd be off to the races uh, serving. And uh, you know, two years turned into ten. Right? And I woke up. I, just, I woke up. I remember. 2008, eight, nine, essentially, I feel like in a fetal position. I was then working as an attorney in a financial service at Borges Investment Group, which is essentially which walks down. And I hated my job. I hated it, right? I uh, was like coming home in a fetal position. I don't know if anyone knows what that feels like, right? <laughs> but you just deeply hate your job because then you're just asking yourself, how did I get here? And I uh, remember I was in DC watching Hillary Clinton's concession speech. She had this line where she said, you know, just because I fail doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to. And I literally thought she was speaking to me. And I said, you know what? I'm just do it. And I then walked into my boss's office a few weeks later, and I quit. And I decided to run for the United States Congress uh, in a Democratic primary against Carol Maloney, who had been there for 18 years. And I thought that was a great idea. Um, I literally thought I could like, shake every hand and knock on every door and win. Of course, that not happen. Uh, and I had no idea what I was doing. But it was the best 10 months of my life um, because it was the most intense experience. I never asked anyone to raise money before. My name was Rashma Sajani. People couldn't even pronounce my name. Um, and we had convinced everyone and anyone that we had a chance. And I remember on election day, I was 
holding our father's hand, we were watching the returns, you know, in a victory credit that never happened, and a little ticker to go past 19%. And I just wanted to cry so bad. And I remember there was this young, Rebecca, 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 was with me, um, and she was staring at me, just watching to see what I would do. And I was, I wanted to cry. I remember Rebecca would remember this moment for the rest of her life, and I wanted to be strong for her. So I cried the next day. <laughs> but... I was, you know, it's like when you lose a race, it's so humiliating, right? And I also pissed off everybody in the Democratic establishment. And I knew, right, that they were just reveling in my misery. Um, but it was in that failure, right? It was in that, like, that depth of failure that, that inspired me to start World of Code. Because the thing I kept thinking about was, again, these girls that I had met on the campaign trail and everything that I had seen and the commitment that I made to them, that made to them, that Oh, sorry, that was a really long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn Malone, you didn't talk to me. For and she <laughs> <laughs> um, So it, it was very controversial. Thank you. Yeah. In Congress, you know, there were a lot of people who said that it wasn't your turn. Yeah. That you should have run against an incumbent. Um, so what beyond, you know, why that? See? Yeah. Well, I, what, I, what people forget is she was going to run against Senator Gillibrand. So when I first ran for this, the front of the seat, I thought it was open. And then she changed her mind. And by then, I had, I was in, right? And I, had, I, had, I quit my job. I was on the website. I was a great deal me. But, you know, I, I, was, I made a decision. And I really still, I didn't get it. Christina, right? Because we had been doing all this work in the Democratic Party, and all I kept hearing about was the need for young women to run, for women to run, for women of color to run. And I thought I was supposed to run, right? That was the whole <laughs> point. Yeah. And I didn't think about the, just didn't think about it as a bad thing to run against another woman. And that was something that really came out in our race, which I just didn't, I, I thought that that was the whole point. Point was to, that if you and there were a lot of things that I was passionate about, like immigration and education, that wasn't being talked about. And I thought that it was never about public loan, right? It was about serving, right, and 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 and, 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 and running on issues that I thought were being talked about. Right. Well, is it a bad thing to run against another woman? Absolutely. Shouldn't we be getting to a place yeah. where yeah. there are women opposing each other in primaries as mm -hmm. there are men opposing each other? I hope every primary is, is that, right, when we have parity in Congress. But I think that that was a shocking thing for folks. And that was what I couldn't get over. I was so confused about why that was a bad thing. Um, and I do think that this is part of the problem, I think, that I see it in, in my work, right, is that women are taught not to compete, right? And then we don't ask for raises. And then we don't apply for the stretch jobs. And then it just like, it's this spiral that goes on and on and on. And that's why I feel like so many of the leadership members are the way that they are. But you got the idea for, for the book. And yes. You know, the, the idea that people said you should wait your turn. And you didn't think that women always had to. No, and I think it's just, I think it was also this idea of like, there is, it, even after all of my, both of my racism, you know, we did well in terms of like raising money and out there and being bold, you know, no one called me the next day and said, good job, when are you running mm -hmm. again, right? Neither in my public advocate race. And I just think that this idea that women were constantly waiting to be recognized, right? We're constantly waiting to be asked. No one's going to ask you. It doesn't happen, right? If you want to start a company, no one's going to come to you and say, you should start a company. You just have to do it. And I think for so long, we think we're going to be recognized as someone's going to see our potential. The reality is men don't think that way. They just run. They just start a business. They just apply for the job. And I think we are so afraid of, of failure of rejection. I always say with men, it's like, you know, at a young age, they're like, you know, they hit on a woman. She tells them to piss off, and they do it all over again. They just don't <laughs> care. They don't care. There's a we do. And it's so much of that I see in the industry and now with technology of why men start companies and then they lose $100 million, they just start another company, and they start another company, and they start another company, and they're so free to do that. And it's the same thing in running for office. So you were still determined to serve. Yeah. You found a way, you explored some opportunities. 
The opportunity came along for you to serve as the deputy public advocate. You weren't sure at first whether you were going to do it, but yeah. you decided to. So, to your question, <laughs> why did you decide to do that? And what did you learn from working through the man who was now mayor? Mercy, <laughs> man. Um, <laughs> well, I, after I lost my after I lost my congressional race, it's very clear to me that like one, I was happy. Like, I loved I loved talking to people. I loved meeting people. I loved thinking about how I could serve people. And so I wasn't going back to finance. I wasn't going back to the law. And my parents were in a comfortable enough position that I didn't have to worry about helping them. And for so long, I had to pay for the mortgage. And I was a critical part of. of my family's financial well-being, and I felt like I could take a step that was about how I wanted to spend my day and spend. And we always say in Hinduism, like, what's your dharma? Like, what is, what's God put you on this earth to do? And I've always felt compelled to serve, but I didn't have an option financially for a while, and I, and I did after my congressional race. And so I thought about what's the best way that I can I do that, I can get back. And, and, and of all the people in the Democratic establishment that were pissed off at me, the one person who did answer my call was Bill Blasio. And I sat down with him and said, you know, what are you going to do? He said, you should come work for me. And uh, I had the opportunity to come be his deputy and come run the public book advocacy. Um, I learned a lot about government uh, in, in the time that I spent working at a public advocate's office. Um, I learned a lot about things that I feel I need to change. The, the public advocate's office is really complicated. You don't have a budget. No one really knows what the public advocate does. It's like you have this open mandate to do a lot. And sometimes that, that could allow you to do nothing, right? And so then that can allow you to build something from the ground up. And that's what I did with the public advocate. And then you decided that you wanted to run for the job that didn't yeah. have a budget and nobody knew what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I felt like while I was, I knew, while I was at the public advocate's office, many of the initiatives that I think were really successful, um, I helped build and create. You know, we, we started a fellowship program for undocumented students. We ran a series of having a conversation about uh, the pension fund. We did a lot of work on um, getting, getting money out of politics. And so I really saw the potential for this office um, while I was there. I thought I could, thought I could serve. I also felt like, you know, I, and I feel this way so much more as a, as a mom. I, I just had a baby um, three months ago. And uh, as you can see, I don't feel lost. <laughs> but, um, but I just, you know, I feel like the plight of women and girls in this country, it just, it just pisses me off. You know, the fact that we don't have paid parental leave, right? The fact that I'm nursing right now and I can't find a place ever to pump. And if men had to breastfeed, there'd be like a pump, there'd be a place to breastfeed every two feet, right? <laughs> you couldn't walk without probably walking into a mother, uh, you know, mother's room, uh, father's room. And it, it just, you know, in, in terms of what I see with our mind on women in terms of education, and I felt like there really needed to be a voice and an advocate for the things that women and girls need in our city. And I wanted to know that voice. You had already started Girls Code, right? Yeah. So things were taken. Yes. Yeah. But um, I think fortunately these ten thousand women that's never happened in lost. Yeah, for sure. Um, it seems like this is really what you were meant to do. Well it's so funny, it's it's you know, I you know, brought two elections and especially the last my my public advocates are just crushing for me, to be quite candid. Um I remember was really proud of you know, I felt like we did everything right. And I'll never forget on uh, election day, I'm standing at a pond with, with my father again. Um, and this woman comes running out and I said, Who did you vote for? She said, I voted for that really pretty immigrant girl. I was like, That's me. <laughs> <laughs> she was like clutching, you know, my she was getting clutching my mouth so she probably couldn't pronounce my name. And, you know, and wanted to remember it. And so it was this really kind of just beautiful thing to just watch and to be a part of and and, and so losing was really, really, and losing both of those elections was really hard. I just, like, this could never get a break. You know, I just could never get a break in any of my elections. But Girls Code was quite the opposite, right? It was like, I remember when we launched Girls Code in 2012, I got an email from Cheryl Sandberg. I don't know how she found my email, right? She was like, you're awesome. Like, whatever, whatever you're doing, how can I help you? 
And girls could have been like that, right? It's like, Oprah's on the phone for you. Here's a million dollars in your PayPal account. The world just conspired to make this organization happen and to make get access to these girls for education. And so it's when you have it, it, it and I was running my races at the same time as launching this organization. And so when I sat back at two o'clock in the morning, you know, a month ago while I'm watching infomercials asking how I got to this place and had a moment to really assess, right? It's just sometimes you just even if you think you're not about to do something, like the universe will push you in a direction. And that's very much been my life in terms of politics and what we go. Yeah, the little help from social media, you appreciate yeah. that. Um, you've got a lot of followers, even more than your husband. <laughs> yeah. I know. You're probably, you're, you're probably <laughs> has a Twitter yeah. account. Your baby has a Twitter your baby account. Has Twitter account. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, we're a big believer, right, in the power of social media to communicate and just to be authentic in who you are. Um, and it's really, it's just, it's the most inspiring thing for me to see, again, you know, our young women and, like, what they're doing and how they're doing. I remember reading the last week's journal article, magazine article, about you, and, and you helped Sam say, gee, I don't know if
I can't go anywhere without girls going up to me. And they're so excited about the code. I don't really know how they learn about us. Like, I don't know. But it is the most awesome thing ever that, they're, that, that it's happening, that it's working. And we're not even doing, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're not even doing anything to push them. It's just they're finding it on their own. And they're hearing about it. And they're, they're, and they're, 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 they're loving it. It's awesome. So, do you have something in mind for the next step of what you are going to do to start pushing it? I mean, we're really focused on our alumni efforts now. So, now we want to make sure that once they've gone through Girls Pro, that the pipeline is leaky at every, like, at every step. So, when they view our program, we need to make sure that they have an internship. When they get to college, we need to make sure that they have a, a network of, 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 of young girls and, and opportunities. I have literally over 100 companies that are partnering with us. I need to make sure that it's more than just, oh, that's sweet that these girls are learning how to code in my conference somewhere, right? I need to make sure they hire them. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, there was, a, you know, last last summer, every tech company got hit with their diversity numbers because they were abysmal in terms of women and people of color. And like Google on their earnings report said, the way we're going to solve this program, bullet well, one, girl to code. Well, okay. Now let's see if that's happening. Mm -hmm. Now we have enough women that they can hire in their freshman and sophomore year in their internship programs and put them into the pipeline. So now it's about holding our, our partners accountable. So do you know what this summer holds for girls who come? So we're going to have 1,200 girls that go through our summer program from 20 more years ago, which is absolutely insane. We're going to do a big photo on Times Square with all of We have, third, we have uh, uh, over 350 girls just here in New York City that are going through our summer version program. Uh, so I am basically on planes and trains all summer visiting with Sean on the back, uh, making sure that we visit every program. It's just like, the summer is like my favorite, because I get to see everything that they're doing, they're building. So, four years, is there any one thing that stands up? I've stopped planning my life. If it doesn't work out the way that I think it's going to work out, we'll see. It takes some questions. Um, <laughs> I'm Catherine Lawanson. Um, I'm an attorney. I have two young girls, um, six and a four-year-old, and I, ever since they they were babies, I've been trying to push them into STEM. Um, because even right now, my six-year-old comes home, she's like, you know, this boy in my class said I can't wear this because it's boys, or I can't play with Spider-Man because it's a boy toy. And so I told her, I was like, well, you go back and tell him, as long as you're playing with it, it's a girl's toy. <laughs> I said, if you're playing with Spider-Man, you're a girl. He's, she's like, I did say that. And I said, well, what did you, you and what did he say? She's like, well, you didn't say anything. I was like, well, you need to keep saying that. And I just want to express that so much more needs to be done. Because even now, at, at how far we've advanced in women in in the school systems and in technology, there's still a gap, especially with, with this uh, with our younger generation. Yeah. It's like there's this wall that we constantly have to fight, and I feel like I'm fighting it for my kids. Um, so with girls with code, at what age group um, do is the program open to? So our program is open to we have clubs, after school programs from middle school on up, and our summer immersion programs are in high school. The problem is, is there's there's I can't even point you to a resource, right? There's not the you'd have to learn scratch. You should, and it's easy. You she actually scratch. looked that up yeah. herself. Yeah, and you should do it with her. And I think that that like, we all seventy six percent of girls go to STEM because their parents actually supported them, mothers and fathers. So I think that there's 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 stuff that you can do. You know, um, the problem is, is like, it's deeply cultural what we've done to our girls. I mean, I was at, I spoke at a forum months ago uh, at, a, at a school in, uh, in Rhode Island, an all-girls school. So it was, like a, it was an auditorium with 400 girls from like ages six on up. And I said, how many of you have ever said I hate math? Every kid writes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we would never allow our girls to say I hate to read. Would we? Never. And so I, I just feel like, even when I read through applications, it makes me so sad because so many of the girls say, well, 
my, you know, my teacher told me to focus on, you know, AP English instead of AP computer science. It's just, it's not, a, it's not intentional, right? But there's so much unconscious bias that we have with what boys should be doing, what girls should be doing. I spoke at a conference uh, last week. I was speaking at a conference in Phoenix um, at, for a company called Indeed. And I got an email uh, from uh, one of the guys in my audience, Ken, to me, he was like, Rashma, um, you don't know me, I was in the audience, but I was really moved by your talk. And I went home and I was, and I was talking to my wife about it. And he said, you know, my son, who's 11, he is always very passionate about technology. And his grandparents bought him a, a Xano computer so that he could take it apart. Uh, and he was interested in it. And I, as I was telling my wife about your talk, I turned to my daughter, Sophie, who's nine, and I, I said to her, do you want to play with the computer? She said, of course, Daddy, I'd love to. And she said, he said, I realized I never even asked her. And for three days, he couldn't take her away from it. And she's already started coding on it. It's like, that's the thing. And it's so, if you talk to, you know, when the personal computers came out in the 80s, like, we just marketed them towards boys. And if you talk, if you read Steve Jobs' book, Jeff Dorsey, Mark Zuckerberg, what do they always say? Someone gave me a computer at 12 years old, I took it apart, and now I created Facebook. Boom. <laughs> Girl, literally, girls don't have that experience because, like Ken, right? Until they think about it, they're like, "Oh, like I should be, I should be creating and taking things apart with my daughter as well." And so, there's a, what you're doing is is right. It's fine. Just keep doing it. Can I just comment on that? Sorry. Um, <laughs> But to your point, I think, and Reshma and I were talking about this, if you've got a, 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 you know, your, your kids, the students, and they have any kind of interest in something, not everybody's going to go to high to, on to college. But there are specialty high schools, there's technology specialty high schools, that if they're showing a propensity for this, and this is really geared towards middle school. Yeah. Because the middle school parents have to know that there's a high school that your child who exhibits an interest can go to that specific high school. And yes, they may go on to college, but if not, they could create this really good skill set. So right out of high school, they could go work for Google or they could get a job in Microsoft. So I think we have to, from an educational standpoint, also continue to create opportunities at the high school level that are specific to, to this particular skill set. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about women and having the opportunity to be encouraged. I took a theater in college. Right. I was in a group of women. I was really intimidated. I had nightmares for years after I graduated and I was walking in class. I worked with a computer programmer for 12 years now to write a program for software for our business. But I can't write code. But I can sit there and say, make a computer. If you're comfortable. Having that conversation with them because you've had a little bit of that experience. Well, but the thing is, I can only go as far as having the ideas because I never learned how to do it. So it'll be very interesting down the road to see what this breeds. But this is also why so many women don't start companies because they're not comfortable communicating their idea to an engineer. Right? So it's not just about learning how to code, but it's about having that proficiency so that they can put their, you know, they can ideate but then put it into put it into you spoke at the Women's President's Organization a couple months ago, I did. and you gave the example of Mattel. Blatt. Yeah, my favorite. Okay. Uh, share that with the group because it made us all go. Oh, yeah. My slide, yeah. So, so basically, Barbie put out a book called "I, I Can Be a Computer Science Engineer," and the second page, it basically says that you know the the lines essentially go something like Barbie's friend says, "Oh, Barbie, I see you're designing." you know, a, a robot for your puppy. And Barbie says, yes, I'm only doing the design, but I need Ken and Bill to help me actually create <laughs> the robot. And, and I don't know what it's like. This must have come out in the 80s, 90s, maybe early 2000, no, 2014. And the title of the book is I Can Be a Computer Science Engineer. So these are the things. Right, that our, our girls read, and they see that, and they say, I 
can't, computers are a hard thing, program is a hard thing, it's a boy thing, I need a guy to help me. Well, apropos your comments, and just cumulatively, so like you, I find myself being in technology quite by accident and having to communicate with engineers who I, I truly believe have a completely different genetic code than other people. <laughs> because you say something and you think that the ideation is crystal clear, and sometimes what's returned is something that is unrecognizable. So, um, but to your point, and, and the reason I came here, so my, I'm Nadine Chino and I am the CEO and the co-inventor of Tiger Box Systems and we um, created our company out of our passion for sustainability. So we rent usable boxes and replace cardboard entirely. Um, that being said, we lost a lot of our assets in the course of developing our company to the point where it made me long for a way to track them. Our challenge, of course, is to track everything while it's in motion, which is not so easy to do. And yet we've accomplished that through the dint of going through the process of talking to engineers and so forth. So my question and my purpose for being here is, we are now at that point where we want to hire someone who can be an in-house coder for our company. Because we're tired of outsourcing and having yeah. the blah, blah, blah. How long does this take your, your girls to get through a program such that they're ready to actually not be an intern, but to actually be coding for a company. So our pro so our pro our summer version program is equivalent of four years of computer science education or a half semester of college. So they are having full technical internships at Google, Facebook, etc. Can't hire them unless they want to drop out of school and do that. More college them. But you definitely could put them in, in a technical. I just don't know how technical your needs are. You know. But but um, it's intensive. Like what, what we what Girls in Code teaches is not. There are a lot of organizations out there that are like you know tinker. We, we are producing software yeah. professional. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk. Good luck with your years. Yeah. Lots of tons. Hi. Oh, sorry. You go first. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks. Sharon Henry. I'm a principal at Ralph McKee Career Technical Education High School. And back in 2012, one of my students, Malia Green, was in Girls Who Code. Yes, and now she is uh, going off to Spelman College. One of the things I wanted to... Is she majoring in computer science? I think she is. I think she is, she but is. I'm not sure. She's she split between graphic arts and computer science. Yeah, so I'm not sure. Her, her, I know right, her. yes. Yeah. So she's yeah. And I just have to say that it's one of those things where it's constantly a partnership for those of you who are companies and everything like that. And yes, I remember to bring my business cards, so it's so great that you said Tigerbot. The thing that you want to realize is that um, work-based learning, every high school, my high school in particular, work-based learning uh, is the piece that partners with companies so that the Department of Education will pay for that high school student to be an intern at your company for uh, as long as it's 15 hours a week during the school year and during the summer they'll keep paying throughout the summer for whatever your needs are. So that's something that's a possibility. Another piece that I wanted to bring to your attention is the fact that even now, even though we have, we're part of the software engineering yeah. pilot program piece and everything yeah. like that, and it's breaking through the barrier of the parents yeah. feeling that, well, my child, my girl will go here. So literally, I'm a nagging specialist. <laughs> so it's like I forced three to four girls for in the first class for the software engineering pilot program, based, and now two of them are going to be doing Girls Who Code <laughs> this summer, and then I had to force another six, but it's like, it's almost, it's, it's almost like I'm fighting with the parents to do that, but I just want to say it's really great, work-based learning. <laughs> And every high school that's a full career technical education high school has it. And also, what are you talking about? Well, this is my sister's. So what are you saying? Saying, remind them they can come and talk to you. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yes, come and talk to me, please. Because more than anything else, there's this next piece. Even when you have that software engineering pilot program, it can be dominated by, and I love the young men because they're just as needy in a lot of ways. Oh. But the young women, it's like trying to get, I'm, I'm not only at 30%. 
and it's like, I'm a woman, I'm in charge of the school, and it's like, get in there. And then, hey, well, I want to go into cosmetology. I closed my cos cosmetology program. You should see, I was like on a hit list, so I understand what you're talking about. There are more girls. Breaks my heart. There are 30 percent girls on these stay-at-home moms compared to 20 percent who want to be computer science engineers. So it's who's teaching these girls, men or women? <laughs> Both, but I'll tell you, it's it's that's why end up that we gotta go with the positive because the young ladies when they're in there they are rocking it and they're getting back. I also think the message is like my my father, my friends were also doctor or engineer because you gotta help support family, right? So I think the message of this is a field where you can actually make money and support your family is really really. I just don't think girls necessarily care about that in the same way. Men are excited. Literally, at BBC, I could show you a graph when the social network, and anyone watch that movie about Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah. When that movie came out, you could see a literally 50% increase in the amount of boys that were going into computer science in college, mm -hmm. whereas girls stayed the same. Right? Because the boys are like, oh, I want to make $100 million too. And girls, are not thinking about their careers that way. And that is where we as parents, I think, can play a huge role. I don't know if there's a question from that. Um, no, I, I asked this question in the, uh, in, the, in the matter of the broader issue of the gender divide and overcoming that. And I'm, I'm actively involved in a uh, microfinance group in the Philippines where 95% of the clients are women because they look at businesses. Um, what I'm intrigued by is, is how difficult it is to change people's mindsets. And we're talking about that now. And I look as a comparison at, say, the, how quickly the gay and lesbian movement have brought about change. You know, you look at Ireland, in 20 years it's gone from this illegal act to where it's now being condoned. And is there any connection there or relevance in terms yes, of well shifting people's well <laughs> I, I don't want to simplify it, but I, I, am, I was on the phone today I'm constantly harassing uh, writers and producers from every single studio to say what I know you did, I know that there was a media bias when it came to even if you think about uh, uh, you know 10% of doctors and lawyers were women in the 1970s and now that number is 55% why? L.A. Long, Grace Anatomy, Ally McBeal. If you look at who was on television in the 80s and 90s, it was a lot of hot, smart women, you know, who were doctors and lawyers, and little girls 72. And in with, with marriage, right? It was, it was, it, there was more of, there were more images on television. Um, and when you think about technology, I mean, there's nothing. Mean. Girls who dragged a tattoo, I don't think anything people know that that's a hacker, right? It's, 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 you look at Silicon Valley, HBO, I guess I watch it too, like, there's just no, there's no images of girls. You still think about the guy in a hoodie drinking Red Bull in some basement somewhere. You know, and, and, and if you think about a hacker, what does a hacker do? Do you stay up all night and not even shower? What girl wants to do that? Who wants to do that? Why does it have to be that way? How do we create this program of myth? And it's very interesting because if you think about the original computer systems that were made, they're made by women. So all of the, you know, Lovelace, right, all of these women that were programmers in the, the 20s and 30s, all well, programmers in the 20s and 30s and 40s were women. But then when it became powerful, all of a sudden it was men. So it's funny that you mentioned all of these points. Uh, I actually, so uh, my background, I, I, did, I was an IT recruiter. Uh, for a very major international firm, uh, and I currently work with a firm that works with nonprofits. Uh, and uh, I, I, from a standpoint of an individual, a woman who is looking for an IT position, uh, the funny thing is, is, is that in a lot of times when you're talking with number one IT directors, heads of IT, CTOs, all of them are guys. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with a woman IT director or an IT CTO. I will tell you that in terms of when you are, you know, placing candidates or looking to place candidates, you know, being that you're, you know, a recruitment firm, that if you have one woman, five resumes, and all are guys, 
the IT director, yeah. right off the bat, you know, yeah. literally goes to the guys first. Like the IT, it's like, okay, but why would she, and a lot of it is, how would she fit in with the culture? How would yeah. she fit in with the team? How would all of these other, extra, you know, outside, outside of her technical abilities come into play? And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've run into uh, in that. And in dealing with even heads of yeah. companies, heads of nonprofits, whatever the case may be. And so I guess it's a kind of a two-part question. Number one, that's a huge hurdle to overcome. Yeah. And how would, how would you yourself say to someone who's in a, a, a head of a department or a head of a, an organization or a company saying, hey, listen, this is how, you know, this is how she is different from everyone else, but this is what she brings to the table. Uh, because that's a huge, you know, that, that's huge. And then the second part is, is in terms of that, uh, the amount of individuals, and I, I actually for a few years in college was a computer information systems major. And uh, I noticed that everyone around me for the most part were guys, obviously. Um, but the second part of the question that I wonder is, is you know, like you, you stated about movies that come out in the IT field, and like you said, picture a guy with a hoodie, sitting with Red Bull, sitting up all night, X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I have two nieces uh, who are very technologically inclined and huge on the IT. But there, it's an intimidation factor of, from a young age, like I'm competing with 80% of the population or 80% of the people who want to go into this field are guys. Yeah. Like, I have literally a two out of ten chance just based on that to get a job, let alone all of the other uh, pieces that come into play. How would you tell a child? How would you tell your kids, or how would you tell your nieces or nephews, you know, nieces or, or granddaughters, whatever? Like, you need to get into this field, especially when there's so many barriers to entry uh, for that. And there's other relevance, you know, yeah. that comes into that with other sectors and things, but that's a huge thing. So I think on the, let's try the former, the latter first. So I think that I'm not sure, so my 12-year-old niece is staying with me right now, so in her mind right now, but I'm not sure when I think about our girls that join our program, they don't, they're not facing gender bias yet. So when we have, maybe just ask a question, like, give us an example of how you face discrimination against boys, how boys are discriminating against you. And people would be like, why are you asking this question? Like, I have never faced it yet. I mean, they're so young, right? I mean, 16-year-old girls, like, they basically set the trend. And, like, it's not until they get into college and into the workforce that they really, I think, for most part, kind of see this, right? Now, there's some of that going on where boys are saying this is a boy thing. But for the most part, girls just don't think it's cool. Like, they think the geeky boys are in the computer lab, and they're, like, too cool for school right. to be a part of that. What you're talking about, I think, happens, like, later. And I think that that is then become So then it's, like... I think getting them in the door is about this is fun and this is interesting and it's cool. Girls want to, girls want to solve, they want to solve problems in their community, right? Mm -hmm. So my girls are like, my mother's a beast, I want to live really long, how do I build an app? Or I live in Florida and I keep reading about these parents that are leaving their kids in car seats and I, so I want to put robots in car seats so that they get alert when they left a child there. Or my dad has cancer and I want to save his life. So I'm going to build an algorithm to help detect better. So they're, they're, all they think about is how to make the world community better, and they want to use technology to do that. And so if you can show them that, you can get them in the door. I think your other piece is, is my solution is like world domination. It's like why, <laughs> seriously, it's why I, like, I kill myself, literally kill myself, to grow this organization as fast as I can. Because I know it's working, and if I can put a critical mass into the pipeline, if I could just put three girls, I, mean, I had the most, most amazing email the other day. One of my girls, Amali, African American, got into M MIT Mike's program, which is the most competitive. Mm -hmm. MIT has probably not seen a black woman, you know what I mean? In ever. Mm -hmm. And I got like 10 of them coming, right? And so if I can keep doing that and keep putting those points on the board every year, that we're going to have such critical mass that it's going to change things. I think that the other thing is, in terms of men, yeah, there's some real gender bias in these organizations. And unfortunately, I think engineering and tech is sometimes, there's a subset of that population just in a lot of women and they all know them. But there's also a large part of that population that are becoming fathers, that have daughters, and 
that we're also going to see what happens with their daughters when they become disinterested or get pushed out. And there are allies. I mean, I make myself get on a plane and go speak at these conferences full of men. And I have more people I can, you know what I mean, who's like have that aha moment and they're looking at Sophie being like, I gotta do something. And they're going back and they're hiring that woman and then they're supporting her. Right? So they're not only just hiring her, but making sure that she flourishes in this environment. Because it's hard, and then from my girls' perspective, I gotta make sure that I build up their confidence. So by the time they graduate Girls with Code, they've made a presentation to Cheryl Sandberg and told her why, you know, Facebook apps suck. <laughs> you know, a little bit better. You know, they stood up at, at the at, at the White House and showed President Obama, you know what I mean, their app they built. They, you know, they told, you know, the CEO of eBay that is, you know, that his back end is, is stinks. You know, they've had these crazy experiences, right, where they've become so confident, and then they, they know their stuff, right? They've gotten so much education through growth growth that by the time they get to college and they're at their internship or Google, they are, they are more fearless than you and I have bumped. Hi, so I'm Susan Barry, and uh, in a prior life, I was the founding president of the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. And when we started back in 1997, we faced a similar problem in that most of the procurement officers and supplier diversity executives were male. And the way that we got around that problem is that we gave them positions on our board and our advisory committees and our marketing committees and our education committees so that they had skin in the game. And they then had the opportunity to go back to their companies <coughs> with scorecards and uh, value propositions and they were able to uh, show them how they could get recognition for the company, they could get acceptance for the company within various nonprofit awards programs, etc., for advancing the cause of women entrepreneurs. And I'm <coughs> wondering if something can <coughs> to that. That's exactly, what, that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, we have a lot. Like, Jack Dorsey does anything I ask him to do. He is such a huge advocate of girls' growth. He's always been. Um, Adam Messenger, CTO of Twitter is on my board. I mean, every single one of the CEOs of the companies that I mentioned we get them in a company our program. We I mean, make air shit. Uh, what's it called when you have a, a, fa a fantasy football league thing? Anyway, uh, you know, he, he donates the proceeds of his book to, you know, again, his fantasy football league to girls' club. Like, these are men that are, are titans of industry. They're committed to solving this problem. They're very active. We've gotten them. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Do you have questions? Just Go. in terms of your team, your team is very geographically diversified, yeah. and that's related to something that I want to mimic. I have a business in cybersecurity, which has very little women representation as well. Very similar, actually. Yeah. It's, it's very nascent business. So for me, what interests me is how is that helped you in terms of having this very diversified group across the country, how has that helped you, what have been some hindrances, those types of things? Ooh, that's a long conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, I've learned a lot about how to manage to distribute a team. Sure. Um, I have a full-time staff of almost over 30 and a part-time staff of 150 that all are all across the country. Staff meetings are, are quite the thing now. Um, and so it's helped in terms of like, I don't need to be, we don't need to be everywhere, right? And we can be and have communities that we are deep into. Uh, in Chicago, in Silicon Valley, in Boston, in Washington, D.C. So I think that that is really important. Um, I also think that work is changing. Like, who goes to an office anymore? You know, I'm not like, like, making a joke that I was funny. But um, I think that, you know, I have a lot of women who work for me. I feel like everybody got pregnant this past year and <laughs> have kids, and we're all trying to figure it out. So I think making sure that people feel like they can be at home with their babies and working too, I think, is really, really, really important. So there's a lot of just innovative, I feel like, work with policies that we're, we're trying to figure out. And I think distributing these work, you just have to be really intentional about them. Thank you. That's good. Yep. Thank you very much for this fabulous presentation. My name is Heidi Kutz, and I'm with the Canadian Consulate General here in New York. And uh, obviously, you're scaling at a, at a magnificent rate in the United States. And when you're satisfied with your results and, and your outcomes here, um, <laughs> When and how will you take your movement international, and, and where will you go? So it's really fascinating. I mean, England just made it mandatory for kids to go between the ages of 6 to 15. Uh, Mexico produces the largest amount of computer software engineers in the 
uh, you know, Nigeria, China, Cuba, India, they don't have problems. So it really is a problem here in the United States. And I think we'll solve it. You know, one of the things we didn't get a chance to talk about, but, you know, one of the things I and so, so love what I do in terms of like coming, being the daughter of refugees and feeling like the only reason I'm sitting here is because of education is, you know, I, I had a girl last year who literally would leave a home shelter here in New York City and go to her program at IAC and Mary Gillard's office every day. She would show up. And she would sit next to a girl who probably went to the best school and on the upper east side. But both of them were so disadvantaged when it came to coding education. <laughs> that by the end of the seven weeks, they're equally competitive to a good job at Facebook. It doesn't happen anywhere, right? And half of our girls are from underserved communities, and they're, they're literally having, lifting their families up into the middle class. I see it happen every single day, in every single state in America. And to watch that happen, uh, just gives me so much hope. And also makes me so restless in terms of we're running out of time. You know, like you don't get opportunities like that to just again change entire the trajectories of families because we're doing so much wrong <laughs> in terms of our education system. So I, I gotta solve this problem in my backyard first. And it hurts me because, you know, I get emails every day from girls everywhere. I mean, like, we what are you coming? What are you coming? What are you coming? What we've done is we've open sourced our club's curriculum online so anybody can download it, anywhere, and start start a, a club. I stopped trying to stop girls and go girl clubs. It's just going to happen. Cool. <laughs> you know, so, in, well, now the video's here, but, uh, you know, we want to make sure that anyone can start a club anyway. I guess I just have two comments. My son is in kindergarten in a school here in the city, and their his school is very big on chess. And I was quite amazed that they were teaching chess to kindergarten students, and he actually now competes in tournaments around the school. That's actually part of their classroom curriculum. And I'm listening to you know girls that code and think you know those little ones they they can pick it up immediately, and you know they they can use an iPad or some device better than we can. Yeah. Um, and then I worked in the public advocate's office for a summer <laughs> when I was in college, so I had wonderful experience there too. <laughs> I think we have to go back to your old boss and family to put this in.